It's, it's, it's just not a frivolous saying uh, on a Valentine card or faint words on a piece of Valentine candy. And I found out in the back room this morning that you can make a whole sentence out of those words on those little pieces of Valentine candy. And, and I found out one of those guys must be a romantic. I'll not share which one. I'll let you guess. So, it's not a frivolous saying, and it's not just a statement on a piece of Valentine candy. Oh, it sounds sweet. And we find out that certain people hear that with a romantic shiver, anticipation. It kind of rings their bell, and they say, ooh, and ah. And the giver thinks to themselves, oh, that sounds good. That made a big hit. I carried that out in grand style. Now, most men would not communicate that when they give that gift. No. They might think it internally. Sometimes, though, we miss the serious connotations wrapped up in these two words, be mine. When they are spoken to you or written to you, they are authored from the giver's heart, which is filled with love. They are openly offering themselves. and their heart to the recipient. Can, and they are deliberately uncovering themselves. Deliberately. Okay, my mind goes there. I'll go to, I go ask, I'm not looking for, I'm not looking for a show of hands or nods or anything, but can you remember the first time you said to your prospective mate, man or woman, did you have to think about it? Was you a little bit unsure when you said, I love you. Be mine. You're putting yourself at a degree of risk of rejection. Maybe. But the truth of the matter stays put. It is the truth. Whether you're at risk or not. Think about the Savior. He was, he was saying that all the time. He walked this earth knowing what he was going to do. See, what you do is laying your desire before others. Same thing he did. Laid his desire before others. Seeking for that special person to respond to their heart's cry, be mine. I think this is always true of the true seeker, the giver. If your mate, if it's your mate, or the Lord Jesus Christ, I would be far, I put more confidence in him than I would in any place else. Now, be mine is an unveiled request for oneness. You're mine and no others. And that's not the least bit selfish. That's just the expectation. It is a request, it is an invitation of submission to another with no purpose other than oneness. For some of us, it's a matter of life that we jest with our mates. That's just the way it is, just what happens. We do it, and we enjoy it, they enjoy it sometimes, and sometimes they're not so sure. I'm talking about romance. <laughs> Good morning. We've already discussed off, off, the, 
off the record that most of the men this morning has presented something of this nature to their wives and been, been blessed for it. I choose to believe. So anyhow, be mine is an unveiled request for oneness. Mine, no others. It's a request, an invitation submitted to another for no purpose other than oneness. That's the goal, that's the want, that's the desire. Then the giver stands aside and allows the invitee to choose. Because without a choice, without a commitment, it is vain. It will not be satisfied. You see, the committer has already has already chosen, committed themselves to a course of action. Okay, Gary. Remember, you, you cranked up the courage and said to Jan, I love you. I love you today, <laughs> remember the night. And the hour? Yeah. Oh boy. Then do you remember the time you said, be mine, sort of. Yeah, he remembers. He's a romantic. <laughs> Did you feel at risk? Oh, definitely. Yeah. I, I was exposing myself. Well, yes, you were. Yeah. yeah. At risk, yeah. Yeah. He was fairly confident of the outcome, though. Well, I, I thought maybe. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. <clears throat> you had committed yourself to a course of action. And that's what our Savior has done. He's committed himself to a course of action. He, he says all kinds of things. And some of them we're going to look at this morning. Man is normally seeking a bride. Jesus is seeking a bride. We're going to get into, shortly, into the fifth chapter of Ephesians. And in the ending of that chapter, we use it in marriage counseling all the time, the last verses uh, from about 22, 23 on to, through verse 33. And I'll give you up front, I am normally more pointed to the man than the woman. Because I think therein lies the, some of the issues that the man assumes. You say, well, the woman should assume. Well, they get to assume. Absolutely they do. But I think I think us men need to recognize that in the family we play, not play, we are the hub among which everything basically turns from Christ's point of view. We'll find that he associates the natural marriage of husband and wife to the marriage of his bride, which is the church. And the church revolves around the head. It's not a head that sits there with, with, and demonstrates and, and authority. That's not what he is. Yes, he wants to have the chief seat, but also recognizing in that chief seat as the body or the church, the members, the bride focuses on him, there is an outpouring to them that's not available anyplace else. I think that's what happens in a marriage. If the man takes his position, there's something that happens in that marriage that you'll not find anyplace else. It's not there. See, I think the rest of the responsibility, the provision, the blessing rests with the one who invites from where fellowship issues 
You say, well, that's a rather closed view in this day and age. I let my wife vote. I, I don't know what you do. I let her vote. If I don't let her vote, she votes anyhow. You say, well, that's magnificent. That's meaningful that you do that. I couldn't pronounce the other word. My Bible reads that we submit one to another. And then he goes on from there. I just find this great. But I'm a little off topic. Be mine. Ruth said that she's already shared this two or three times, so let me be the fourth, only I won't ask her to share it. The middle grandson, one up from number three there, so that makes him number two, come crawling out of the cupboard is my understanding, and he was one and a half, two. And uh, I don't know, I don't remember the whole story. All I remember is that he says, as he hugs Grandma, mine, mine. Well, Grandma, just, can you imagine Grandma? Yeah. She's still moved by that mine and that hug. But can you imagine Jesus saying and hugging you, saying, mine. It's just like that. Mine. Mine. George Hesley says, you're sitting in the chair, and it's just like he's holding his, all of his arms and saying, come, and you sit with him as he holds you. Mine. Mine. It's a fellowship thing. Last week we closed with this scripture, 529 of Ephesians. It's in the same sequence of events, and I'll share it with you again. If you want to see a snapshot of man and how he looks at himself, you see it here. No man ever yet hateth his own flesh, but nourishes cherishes it. Now hang on. Even as the Lord does for the church. Now I broke this out, this scripture, and I'm going to read it to you from L.L. L. Winans' version, if he was writing a commentary. And you may see it. In, so here you go. For, for, let me read the verse again, and then I'll break it down. For no man ever yet hateth his own flesh, but nourishes it, cherishes it, even as the Lord the church. For, indeed, no man, not even one, not any man, ever yet, not once aforetime, not even in the old time, not once in times past nor present, hateth, detests, persecutes, abhors his own personal flesh, the symbol of what is external, with its frailties, physically and morally, passions of the flesh. But nay, rather he nourishes it to warm with tender love, tender care, gives heed to it, listens to it, broods upon it as a chicken on an egg, spending much time, much patience to establish its comfort. He treats the flesh with affections and tenderness, so ought he to treat his own wife. Even as, according to, equivalent to, in the sense of proportion and comparison, likewise as the Lord, the one supreme in authority, Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, our owner, our master, our savior, to the church, the called ones, the invited ones to be his. He is saying, calling, inviting, be mine. This is how I will treat you. Then you exclaim together, mine. Oneness achieved, we're one, and each is mine. This is the close, intimate union between the Christian and the Savior, a union so intimate that they may be spoken of as one. So strong is this oneness, this love, that the recipient is willing to forsake 
mother, father, home, maybe even leave a country. Abandon his possessions, go to distant lands, dwell among, I like to say the enlightened, but some might consider going where they are barbarians, heathens, or and some of us just all to make the Redeemer known. I got a call from Dale this morning from the Ukraine, strictly there to make Jesus known. I'll tell you this, he ran across a man that has no concept of love. He's coming to a Bible study, literally no concept of love. 1 Corinthians 13, he says, it's like reading nothing to him. He has no understanding of it whatsoever. None. 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 This love is stronger than what man has for his own self. And people look at you and wonder, how can this be? And we must recognize that it is of divine origin. It comes from no place else. There's nothing like it. The topic, if you got the set of notes or looking at your bulletin, it's two Valentines and the message contained. Actually, I guess it's one Valentine on two pages. Simply put, the cover says a portion of John 3.16, for God so loved he gave. The inside message from Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30, come unto me. Get the simplicity of this? Come unto me. All you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What gentleness, what sweetness. The very style of the invitation saying, come to me. I will refresh you. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart. You shall find rest unto your souls. Learn this lesson from me. I am meek, I am lowly. I am mild, gentle, reasonable, tender. Receive rest, relief, blessed, quiet. That's his message to you, to take away the load to give you rest. My yoke is easy, mild, pleasant, the opposite of harsh and sharp and bitter. My burden is light, light and weight, easy to be borne. Many don't think in those terms, but that's exactly what he's communicating, exactly in his Valentine to all of us and to the world this morning. If he was writing a Valentine, actually, he wrote a whole book that can be classed as God's love message to you. Absolutely. Now here we go to intimate words of commitment from the Song of Solomon. And I have to admit, I took me a little effort to begin to dig out what he wanted out of this. He says there in 2.16, he says, first, as I put first, my beloved is mine, and I am his. He feedeth me among the lilies. I says, oh, yeah, so? Now, probably some of you you know, when it comes to flowers, are rather sensitive. But here he says, my beloved, my companion, is mine. Turnabout is true. I am his. So if you're loved by a lover and a friend, he feedeth among the lilies. We'll find out maybe a little more about the lilies in a moment. 6.3 of the Song of Solomon says, secondly, I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. He feedeth me among the lilies. What he is to me, and I to him, may be better conceived and experienced better than what we're able to communicate. You have times with your mate where silence is fine. A twinkle of an eye is communication. You don't need words. It's just the atmosphere. Just the presence. Do you like those times? 
They are precious. They are precious. Times to be remembered. Well, see, this is the unspeakable privilege of true believers that Christ is theirs. My beloved is mine. I am to him, perhaps as a wife or a bride. I have, he has, I am his possession. We get a hold of that truth that a believer, according to Ephesians 1, is the believer is God's inheritance. You say, well, I received him. I'm his inheritance. Huh. That's true. But think about it. We are God's inheritance. We are God's inheritance. That is, that is awesome. That is a... What does that do for you? I'm in his confidence. I get to share... What he, teach, what he wants to share with me. I get to understand him more. He gets to turn the light of the truth on, on me, on you, on his possession. You see, I don't want to be known as a possession. Hello? You want to make somebody's a possession. Agreed together, but somebody is. I receive of his fullness. That's exactly what believers, they're partakers of Christ. All believers are as little as in his eyes. He feeds among them. That is, he takes as much pleasure in them and their time together as a man does. <laughs> I look for an illustration. Uh, this particular author says it's uh, as your table or garden. Uh, the only thing I can liken that to is Gary's rye field, and that doesn't sound quite right. Or as much pleasure as, I would say, Gary and Paul, but he's not here this morning, in their pole barn. Uh, these are places for Gary in his basement. You see, these are places where you meet and the fellowship and the relationship of, of this communication is intimate. Intimate fellowship. I like it. Now, hang on. For you, he brings a romance. You say, well, just a minute. I've never heard such a thing. He brings a romance. In the Song of Solomon, again in chapter 2, beginning of the first four verses, he said... She said, I am the rose of Sharon, the lily of the valleys. Solomon replied, as the lily is among thorns, so is my love among the daughters. You got that? His bride, or Christ's bride, is speaking of the body of Christ in comparison to the church, is a lily, the surroundings outside you, the believer, is the world. And they are like thorns, as we have already discussed, that God so loved us, he gave his only begotten son. Verse 3, as the apple tree among the trees of the woods, so is my beloved among the sons. I sat down under the shadow with great delight, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. He brought me to his banqueting table, and his banner over us, over me, was love. Now that took a little doing for me to come to grips with, I'm sick of his love. Or, how's it put it? I was sick. His fruit was sweet to my taste. Uh, where is it? Was that before there? Oh no. We're going to get to it. Just a minute. Where he says, where she says, I am sick of his love. Give me five and six as long as I've messed up this far. If you would, please. Somebody go ahead and pronounce that word over there. You want to do it? 
Uh, I guess it's flagons or some such thing. Stay with me. Stay me with. Anybody else? God in his sense of humor is amazing. Somewhere in our travels ministering, we got to a church that put Ruth and I in a house with a family and the lady was an English teacher. How'd that make you feel? I felt quite comfortable. I don't know how she felt. Because I was me wherever I was at, you know, and that's it. One interpreter says you talk with a lot of slang. Probably do. Stay with, stay me with flagons of comfort and comfort me with apples. Oh, well, that's strange. For I am sick of love. His left hand is under my head and his right hand doth embrace me. I thought, what in the world is he talking about? Can you, can you imagine? Wow. Well, I get the fruit. His fruit was sweet to my taste. I can get. He took me out to dinner. He fed me. I can understand the banner over us is love. His banner. There's a sense of protection and safekeeping. That's fine. He labels it as such. He commits to that. That's part of his, his uh, provision when you are his. Okay. Stay. Lean on me. Take hold of me. Establish me, refresh me. This word on the end of that sentence there is pressed together. It is actually cake of raisins from the Hebrew. So she's being fed again. This time comfort, refresh, and me with apples, for I am sick of love. Now let me do something with that. So she professes her strong affection, most passionate love to, to the husband to the bridegroom I am sick of love overcame overpowered by it okay has anybody ever been so in love that they were about sick to their stomach huh is that possible Azan. <laughs> Elaine Anybody? Okay. No volunteers. Gary, are you going to volunteer? <laughs> no. All right. I got the point. Nobody's going to volunteer. Kay? No, nobody. All right. You ever have butterflies? Okay. Okay, then according to this, apples will take care of that. I knew when we started this, I was going to get in here pretty deep, I guess. Let me, let me do this. She says, I am sick of love, overcome, overpowered by it. David explains, my soul faints for thy salvation. Perhaps she's waiting for his return and cannot bear the grief of distance and delay. Or how much better it is to be sick for love of the Savior than for the things surrounding. So comfort me with apples, with the fruits of the apple tree in the midst of the woods. You will not want in the spiritual realm support or spiritual comforts. In him they are present. She experiences the power and tenderness of divine grace. A very present help. Satisfying. And then his hand is under my head. We are all in his hands. 
and he tenderly holds our head. His hand embraces me, gives me unquestionable assurance of his love. In his hands. Okay. A simple message of love, a message, a reminder. And you're going to have to put the scriptures to this. I'm not going to do it. We have, I can, we've already talked about, he himself took our load and gave us his rest, Matthew 11. He took our infirmities and gave us his strength, Matthew 8. He himself bare our sickness and gave us his help, Matthew 8 again. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he was made sin with our sin and in return gave us his righteousness. I'm not going to go into a discourse about righteousness, only from this standpoint. My attention was drawn to Matthew 13, 43. Then shall the righteous shine forth as a sun in the kingdom of their father. Got it? On that great day, in him we shine forth publicly. In that great day coming, in the world to come, we're going to shine as the sun of righteousness. The sun. The old covenant talked about uh, comparing the, to the firmament and the stars, but here to the sun. For life and immortality are brought to light by the gospel. Be mine is God's invitation to man with his full commitment to oneness. Ephesians 5, 31. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, shall be joined unto his wife, and the two shall be one flesh, or one. Since the beginning, the creation of the church was from a single man, Christ. Just as from Adam and Eve came the first child, or just as come from Christ, you are his bride, just as Eve was taken from Adam and she became his bride. But he's not talking about altogether natural marriage here. He's talking about spiritual application. To be taken naturally, absolutely. A man must leave. Two shall be one. But in a spiritual marriage as represented by the natural marriage in which Christ shall be one flesh, husbands and wife complement one another. So Christ the church are incomplete without each other. You got it? As Christ and the church, without you having him and being members of his body, or part of his bride, you are complete. Incomplete, excuse me. You are incomplete. But he doesn't have you. And he longs for you. And he loves you. With something that's beyond our ability, I think, to comprehend. He is the head. Natural man cannot understand this oneness. Natural man. Natural man outside the fold of the kingdom. Oh, let me just tell you this too. You are the kingdom of God. You are the kingdom of God. You are different than what surrounds you. You are of a different kingdom. We're in this one, but we're not of it. Put that on your plate. In verse 32, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church, and that's what he's telling us, that he is here. He compares, compares the marriage union between a man and a woman to the fellowship that God himself has with us. Marriage is a scale model of the enduring, lasting fellowship with, with Christ.
our union with Christ is a supreme example of what a marriage should be. Now, some of us have been at this a fair spell. Ruth tells me that in, a, in about three months, I remember, we'll have, she, we'll have 56 years in. 56? Am I old enough for that? And practically 50 years, between 45 and 50, we have been one with him. Wow. Wow. Verse 33, all you husbands and husbands-to-be stand ready. Never let let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as, same as, compared to, equivalent to himself and the wife see that she reverence her husband. But himself is in the same measure as we read way earlier in the message that even as Christ loved the church. I told you last week and I think once before and I, I, I smile when I look at it, and I'm glad that no, nobody asked me before I was married. But as we went through this, and so there's a scripture that says Christ gave his life for the church, the lady in their home, sitting on the couch, looked at a husband-to-be and said, called him by name and said, would you die for me? He looked at me and kind of smiled, never said a word. We went back for another session and my curiosity knows no limits, of course. And I said, called him, I says, have you decided that she got an answer to her question from last time? Would you die for her? I got the same smile. Now, I believe he loves her sincerely. And in this case, he just might, but he's not gonna talk about it, <laughs> okay? Uh, commitment level is there. Wow. So husbands, love your wives, even as Christ the church and even as yourself. I've got one last word today. It may be a couple, three sentences long. And it will be fairly direct. Not all Valentine candy is sweet chocolate with a deep, satisfying filling. Some Valentine's candy is chalky. Nowhere as sweet as the words printed on them. Got it? They may, may call themselves sweet. We have been in, invited and introduced and to the greatest love message of all times. God's invitation is saying, be mine. This love message expands, secondly, when it is accepted. Accepted. The result is you are esteemed as his believers, his friends. He testifies, you are mine. It's a personal testimony given right straight to you. You are mine. I don't know how it comes. It may come in words. It may come in senses. It may come with the absolute feeling of relaxation of peace. You know it's true. You are his. And as mine, you are joint heirs, sons of God. Mine. The tragedy arises when this love message is not accepted. It becomes a message in the long run, out there, a message of unending death to those who don't believe and receive. The tragedy continues. They will remember unendingly that they rejected his love, the invitation to enter oneness with him, ever knowing, never knowing the reality of being mine.
He makes it personal. It's a personal decision. Boy. What do we do with him? I far want it. I want to be hugged on. You need to be hugged on. He's yours for the hugging. Your initiative, your acceptance. Father, this morning, we give you praise, honor, and glory. You welcome the whosoever will may come and partake of the water of the fountain of life freely. Your message was first given to your enemies, those estranged and far from you. That message is still ringing today. The welcomingness of a message is yours. You place it out there, and the whosoever wills may come. Thank you for the privilege. You accept the whosoever's. You need to settle it today. Settle it. Our recommendation is you settle it. His recommendation is you settle it and accept him as God's love gift to you this Valentine's Day as we celebrate it in this world. May your new life be celebrated as such in the next world. They're his, they're mine. Wrapped up in you, in Jesus' name. Amen.